I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Joining me today is perhaps the world's most famous climate scientist, Dr. James Hansen, Director of Climate Science Awareness and Solutions at Columbia University's Earth Institute. Formerly the leader of NASA's space studies, Hansen recently returned from the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Shareholders Conference, where he pitched Warren Buffett and fellow investors on a carbon fee. His discussion, Energy and Climate Change, How Justice Can Be Achieved for Young People, focused on the intergenerational imperative of climate change and the harm climate disruption poses to us, millennials and their children and grandchildren. Hansen's newest study, alongside his European counterparts, projects more melted ice sheets, rising sea levels, and super storms. As we've explored here on this program, the consensus of modeling forecasts a dangerous doom and gloom that puts in jeopardy the habitability of the planet just decades from now. I want to welcome Jim, James, Dr. Hansen. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Now, we were talking off camera, and in, in The Guardian, you said in response to the Paris talks, it's really a fraud, a fake. And I said, you know, yeah. people in our industry have a tendency, not this show per se, to hyperbolize. And so I asked you off camera, I wanted to give you the courtesy of clarifying People know your perspective and the science that substantiates it, but I wanted to ask you to elaborate why a fraud or a fake, the Paris talks. Yeah, absolutely, because it's not going to reduce emissions globally. You know, it's analogous to the Kyoto Protocol. People clapped themselves on the back after that and pretended that it was addressing the problem, and emissions accelerated. You know, as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, then people will keep burning them. So, but they're, of course, they're not really the cheapest because they don't include their cost to society. The effect of fossil fuels on human health, on, uh, on climate change, we need to include those costs in the price of the fuels. Now, the argument you were making to Mr. Buffett and his colleagues uh, reminded me of a show I did with Kate Gordon, who leads the Paulson Institute which has created this kind of index to measure the cost of doing dirty business mm -hmm. with carbon emissions. Was that the playbook that you went in there with? And how successful do you think your pitch was? Well, I won't know how successful until, you know, I didn't ask him for an answer on the spot because I was afraid of what the answer would be. But if he thinks about it, you know, he has children and he, he's a good person, I think. And once you really understand the moral implications of us continuing to burn fossil fuels and what that's going to mean for young people and their children, then it can change your perspective. One of my sisters said, uh, where's Tiny Tim? You know, we've got, to, we've got to make people think about young people and what our actions mean for them. Just making more money is not a very good legacy. So in my remarks, I mentioned it could be his greatest legacy if he would just, because the public, so much of the public has great respect for him. So if he would make a comment that we really need to make the price of fossil fuels honest, um, I think that could have a big effect. If I say it, you know, hundreds of people might hear. If he says it, millions of people hear. The Buffett rule in the economic lexicon was not adopted when it comes to tax reform. I remember he made a pitch to, through the Washington Post, a column there, about taxing the rich. And where has that well, gone? Well, that, yeah, but that uh, comment still rings. And I think we will address uh, the disparity in the tax rules. I, the public wants to see that fixed, and I think it will be fixed over I'm not sure how rapidly, but I believe it will be. And so I think his, his uh, word means a lot. If you think about wildfires in California, or if you think about drought in the Midwest, alternatively, you could think about Superstorm Sandy here in the Northeast and the potential threat that looms for another Katrina or Rita-type disaster on the southern coast, the southeast here. If you're making that pitch, the one thing Warren Buffett stays true to is his native Nebraska. How are the people of Nebraska being affected by climate change? 
oh, well, I think climate change is now a global issue. I like appreciate that too. Things like sea level rise. Mm -hmm. If we allow the ice sheets to go unstable, we will lose the coastal cities. And more than half of the large cities in the world are on coastlines. The economic implications of that are incalculable. And the number of refugees would be in the hundreds of millions. Compare that to the present number of a, a million or so is a, is a problem. When you're talking hundreds of millions, it may, the planet may become ungovernable. I completely acknowledge what you're saying at the same time realizing that politics is all visceral and all local like the yeah. former speaker Tip O'Neill said and you're a Midwestern son yeah. I'm, I'm wondering when you made that when you constructed the pitch to a Nebraska constituency born and mm -hmm. bred mm -hmm. what made that unique and to your mind was there that global consciousness or are they saying not in my backyard or at least not in my backyard yet. You know, I was quite impressed by Nebraskans. They stepped up, some farmers stepped up and said, we're not gonna let this pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline, mm -hmm. cross our lands. And they recognized the, not just the effect of that on the possible spillage on their property, but also just the fact that it is an intergenerational injustice for us to continue to expand the extraction of these fossil fuels after we realize the problems they're going to cause. You know, our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations, but we can only pretend that we don't know. We know very well. What I find telling is remembering the New York Times A1 photo of President Obama drinking the water from Flint, Michigan, and the ambivalence in his eyes when he was sipping that glass well, we see the impact of lead and paint or water fountains, and families are experiencing it. How do you relate your new groundbreaking study here to the American family in Iowa or Nebraska? That Taxi. is the fundamental difficulty. You know, we don't react until the problem is at our doorstep. And that's what makes climate change particularly difficult issue because the climate system has this great inertia. Much of the response to the gases already in the atmosphere is going to occur over the next few decades and even few centuries. And another, and what makes it all the more difficult is the fact that our solutions are going to require changing the energy system, and that requires decades. So it's a very difficult problem. But that's, we're, that's what we're faced with, and we've got to communicate that this, uh, to the public. And, you know, we should hope that our elected officials would help us do that. But in fact, what I find is that both political parties have substantial obligations to lobbyists, to special interests. Our democracy is not as pure as when it started out. There's too much role of money in Washington. And I find that's true in both political parties. We were not as a global community paralyzed in the sense that we could not, you call it a fraud, but we could not agree to some basic terms. Now you say that it's minimal. Well, but it's an agreement that there is a climate problem, right. but it's not an agreement for a solution. You have to see what would that look like? The solution has to recognize that we cannot allow fossil fuels to, uh, we're not only not making them pay their costs, we actually have governments who are subsidizing them. Uh, we, so it's basically being unfair to young people and future generations because the benefit of burning the fossil fuels goes to the present generation while the future generations bear most of the cost. And you really think, Doctor, that a long-term a long-term shutdown of fossil fuels is not a viable strategy at this point? Well, it'll, it, it, it has to be short-term It has to, immediate. no, no, it ha well, it's going to have to be phased in. So what we advocate is a gradually rising carbon fee, because you can't suddenly just turn off the fossil fuels. The economic implications would be uh, very disruptive. So, but what you can do 
is just add a, a rising fee, collect it from the fossil fuel companies at the, the domestic mine or the port of entry, so it's a very small number of sources, and you have to give the money to the public. So you don't give the money to the government because then it's a tax, and a tax depresses the economy. But if you give the money to the public, especially if you divide it equally among all legal residents, it actually spurs the economy. The economic studies show that if you did added a $10 a ton uh, tax or fee to, uh, to fossil fuels, at the end of 10 years, it reduces U.S. emissions 30%. It increases the GNP, creates several million new jobs, so it spurs the economy. That's, that's what we need to do, and it, it's straightforward. But politicians uh, prefer, they, they have uh, a debt to so many lobbyists. So, you know, I, I went uh, I, into the office of uh, Senator John Kerry when he was still the senator, and tried to persuade him, you have to have a rising carbon fee and you have to give the money to the public. After about an hour, he agreed, well, that, that's better, that makes more sense, but I can't get one vote for that in the Congress. So what did they do? They proposed a bill 3,500 pages long. Every lobbyist who could write a paragraph got it stapled into the bill. That's the way our government is now working. Lobbyists are basically running the government. They, they're getting what they want. What we need is to do what the public needs, not what the lobbyists need. Do you see an instrument other than the UN that could operate as the source of global governance to institute that uh, kind of? The United Nations can, cannot. Uh, but can, cannot, is it, there an entity that there, could? The United Nations, you can't have 190 nations sitting around uh, a table what you need is the major powers to agree, and that means China and the United States. It only requires those two nations. If they would say we're going to have a rising carbon fee, they could also put border duties on products from countries that do not have an equivalent fee. That would be a huge incentive for these other countries to have their own fee so they can collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the borders. That would work. Economists say that would work. The World Trade Organization, that's consistent with the rules of it. So we could do it. But it's got the, these, uh, the United States has to realize that there really is a problem here. You've been called a, an alarmist, but you're also portraying the reality of now and the reality potentially even more so of the future, Dr. Hansen. You must take some pride or at least be cognizant of, if not the transformation of the vast lobbyist complex in D.C., the picture that was the Bush administration when that president's team was editing out your findings of climate change being real to a two-term presidency that may not have responded as comprehensively or acutely um, where there is need, but that was not denying the problem and in fact starting, beginning to address the problem. I, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately I can't do that because it, we missed an opportunity. If President Obama at the beginning of his administration had tried to explain, had taken this as the first issue, and it should have been the first issue because national security, economic security, and climate security all depend upon this. And health care, which was the first initiative, could have been interwoven into Yeah, that. yeah, but he has to explain it to the public. He'd have to, like Franklin Roosevelt, he'd have to have fireside chats. He didn't tend to do that, and he didn't take this as an early issue, and he didn't seem to understand. He took the standard democratic approach which is more regulations, and they've even attempted to get taxes on it, but that, that's not going to work. The, so, you know, I, I wish I could When somehow. you say the standard democratic approach, if the Republican approach was denial, the standard democratic approach you're insinuating is regulation? Yeah, that's... But uh, expound on that. Yeah, well, so, you know, I've explained what... I think is needed. Right. A revenue neutral rising carbon fee. Um, 
and I can't get either party to take that as their position. That's why I argue, I'm going to conclude in the book that I'm starting to write now that we probably need a new party. I, I call it the American Party or maybe the American Revolution. It's, it has to be, it has to give up with taking money from lobbyists. And it has to have policies that are in the public's best interest. And, and this issue should be central because this is actually the way, place you should get money. Um, the economy should be partly based on uh, how we price uh, fossil fuels. And now with the explosion of natural gas, which is really an increasing mm -hmm. source of energy, that has been touted by this administration as a way to it could, be, it could be a bridge fuel if you had a rising carbon fee because then coal would fall off the table quickly and things like tar sands, which mm -hmm. are very carbon intensive, they would fall off the table immediately. And temporarily we would be using some gas, but then we would have to move off of that also because there's a lot of gas in the ground. And when we look at the planet's uh, climate and carbon budget, we realize we can't burn all that gas. So we ha can't take that and just replace coal with that without this rising carbon fee. We ha that has to be a bridge fuel. From the basic core of the research that is newest as of mm -hmm. summer 2016, what are you finding now about the potential pattern of climate change and disruption that is new from what you found just within the last decade? Yeah, well, I think the important thing that's new is that we find that the fresh water that is being injected onto the ocean surface uh, around Greenland and around Antarctica affects the ocean circulation in a way which actually enhances the melting of the ice, uh, the ice shelves that come out from the ice sheets on Antarctica and Greenland. And that's a very dangerous amplifying uh, feedback because um, it allow, as you melt these ice shelves, it allows the ice sheets to discharge their ice to the ocean more rapidly. And uh, there are at least several meters of sea level included in the, uh, <clears throat> in the vulnerable ice on Antarctica and Greenland. So there's the potential for several meters of sea level rise relatively rapidly because of these amplifying feedbacks. It makes things happen faster. And we're beginning to see that. The records are short, but when we look at the mass of the Greenland ice sheet, which you can now measure from the gravity satellite very accurately, and the mass of the Antarctic ice sheet, we see that they're beginning to lose mass more and more rapidly. And we see that the, uh, the oceans around uh, Antarctic are beginning to cool from this fresh water that's being injected from the melting ice. And plainly spoken, once those sheets melt, there is no recourse? Yeah, the problem is it takes thousands of years for ice sheets to build up. And so sea level, if we once let the ice sheets disintegrate, those, all the coastal cities will be lost. All the history and the, the economic implications are just enormous if we lose cities like New York City. Are we constantly monitoring the sheets? Do they have yeah. names? Yeah, yeah, we now have this spectacular gravity satellites which can measure the gravitational field of the Earth so precisely that you can see not only that the ice sheets are losing or gaining mass, but it, how different pieces of the ice sheet are losing or gaining mass. So we're doing a pretty good job of uh, monitoring the ice sheets and also the ocean because you know, the fundamental thing is that when you add CO2 to the atmosphere, it's like putting a blanket on the planet. So it re it reduces the amount of heat radiation going to space. So there's an imbalance. The amount of energy coming in from the sun exceeds the heat going out. And where is that energy going? The atmosphere has a very small heat capacity. So most of it goes into the ocean. And we now have more than 3,000 floats distributed all around the world's ocean, which dive down into the ocean to two kilometer depth, come back to the surface, radio the information to a satellite. 
So we can measure now the heat content of the ocean quite accurately. And what we see is the planet is out of energy balance. There's more energy coming in than going out. The oceans are getting warmer. And if we want to stabilize climate, we have to restore that energy balance. That's how we come up with the fact that we had better reduce CO2 to no more than about 350 parts per million. That's what we'll have to do if we want to restore energy balance and stabilize climate. We had uh, Gerardo Ceballos, I don't know if you're familiar with that name, on uh, the show recently. And we contemplated the potential for a mass human extinction through climate change, through weather, weather patterns that are going to radically alter the way we're able to live or not able to live. As I see you nod affirmatively in mm -hmm. thinking about that future, what to you in the absence of these kind of radical steps that governments are failing to take, what is, what is the lay person watching this have besides political capital if they form with their brothers and sisters to make this a movement? That's the, the issue. They cannot personally solve the problem. Even if you band together with millions of people and try to reduce your emissions, there are billions of people on the planet and there are many countries where they want to raise the people out of poverty and they're going to burn fossil fuels if there's no alternatives. So we have to, we have to affect policies. Uh, governments have to step up to the job and the job has to include making the price of fossil fuels honest. It's very simple and if governments would try to explain this to the public you know, you're going to have the price of fuel at the pump is going to go up. But if the money that's collected from the fossil fuel companies is given to the public, most people can come out ahead. So this could be explained. Um, there was the director of the, an organization called Republicans for the Environment who said, gee, this makes a lot of sense. You could explain this in a two-minute elevator talk. Well. So there are people who understand this, but our politicians are still too much bound by the special interests and the lobbyists and the fossil fuel money. And the public is confused because they see advertisements on television from, I am an energy voter. The fossil fuel company makes it sound very logical. Oh, the f more oil in North Dakota is making the United States more energy independent and creating jobs. Uh, yeah, it sounds logical. Unfortunately, it's not actually what's in our best interest in the long run. When you describe, in the minutes we have remaining, when you describe that process by which the public would monetarily benefit, get a fee that is that the fossil fuel companies are subjected to, how, how would you ensure that the money going to the public is not thrust back into the vicious cycle of the present scheme? Sure, and on the first day that you get your dividend, you may go out and, and spend money on fuel for your present vehicle. But the next time you buy one, you would like to come out ahead. And, and you know, everything that you buy is affected by fossil fuel prices, some things more than others. So it will automatically be included. You will, when you buy things, you will tend to buy things that do not have as heavy a tax on them. It's, it's about creating a disincentive. That yeah. is the number one right. principal and, goal. And, yeah, and as the economic studies show, people will many people will change their practices because they have other things to use their money for. They don't want to waste it on fossil fuels if they have alternatives. The whole idea of teaching one's carbon footprint, is that an obsolete model of how, you know, how Well, you don't even have to worry about it. You know, for example, if, as the carbon fee goes up, food that's imported from New Zealand will become more expensive the family, the nearby farm will be favored because it'll have a smaller transportation requirement. So uh, different things on the store shelves right. will have a bigger or smaller carbon footprint and that will be reflected in their prices. So you don't have to sit down and calculate right. your carbon footprint. You just pay attention to the prices of what you buy.
What countries do you think are getting it right in adopting models like the carbon fee you imagine? Well, uh, no one has adopted um, a revenue neutral carbon fee. I've gone to about a dozen different countries and tried to persuade um, them of such a model. It turns out that the fossil fuel industry is powerful in all governments that I've uh, become acquainted with. So the public is going to have to understand this. Um, it's not easy, but uh, the future for our children and grandchildren depends upon us getting this right and doing it soon. Is there a country that's come close, remotely close, to what you're imagining? Well, they're, they're, Sweden is a good example of a country that decarbonized its electricity. And that's the most fundamental requirement for solving the climate problem. Because although they still have a carbon footprint, because their vehicles are using petrol, are using carbon-based fuels. But you can make uh, fuels once you have carbon-free electricity. So they uh, have a lot of hydropower and they built nine nuclear power plants. So they have completely carbon-free electricity. So they've come the closest. They have the smallest carbon footprint. Dr. Hansen, thank you for being here today and for sharing an example of some possible progress in the future. Thanks. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.